Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. While many books, articles, and social media posts offer advice on adulting in our daily lives, there's only one resource to help us become spiritually mature believers, God's Word. This study in the book of James with Pastor Skip will encourage you to embrace discipline and difficulty to glorify God and demonstrate your faith to others. Good morning. Well, it's time for the Word of God. So let's turn in our Bibles to James chapter 2, please. We're doing a series called Adulting, based on the theme of the book of James, which is Christian maturity. So we are um, now, we've made it all the way to chapter 2 of this short little book, and that's quite a feat uh, given the fact that I can spend a long time in books of the Bible. Uh, but um, we've already made it to chapter 2, and it's a very timely topic. So I'm going to begin this way. There's childish ways to handle other people, and there are mature ways to handle other people. So, for instance, if somebody yells at you, and your response is to yell louder at them, is that childish or mature? Yeah, that's childish because the Bible says a soft answer is what turns away wrath. If somebody sulks or they throw a tantrum because they didn't get their way, is that childish or is that mature? That's childish. That's what kids do. If someone slanders you and you calmly correct that slander with truth, is that childish or mature? That's mature. If you're driving home from church on Osuna Road <laughs> and somebody pulls in front of you in your lane and your response is to lay on the horn for a long time <laughs> and then follow them all through town because they did that, Childish or mature? Childish. Please don't say mature. <laughs> if somebody bullies you and you decide to stand up to the bully, childish or mature? It's mature. You're overcoming fear. You're setting boundaries. If uh, somebody is beautifully dressed and really good looking and they enter the room and you fawn all over them, Childish or mature? Childish. And that brings us to the very heart of what James is talking about in the next paragraph in James chapter 2. Now James is writing this letter, this little book, to a group of people, and he is speaking about maturity, Christian growth, and tests. How can you tell if a person is grown up in the faith? And he gives several tests in this book. So far, he has given us the test of how we handle trials. That's the first test. How do we handle trials? Second test, how do we handle temptation? Third test, how do we handle the Word of God? And fourth test, how do we handle other people? When you think of the attributes of God and you think of words that describe God's inherent character, there's a lot of words that you could use to describe God. You could use the word power because He is all-powerful. You could certainly use the word love because the Bible tells us God is love. Words like compassionate, words like holiness, um, immutability is another word, means God never changes. Eternality, God is always there from beginning to end. He, never, he always was, always will be. He is faithful, gracious, omniscient, etc., etc., etc. So many words describe the character of God. But there's another word, there's another attribute that people don't speak of that much, but it is also true that it describes God. And it is the term impartial. God is impartial. God is unfazed by human status. He is 
never impressed. God never looks at a person and goes, wow, like that guy, that gal has something that others don't. He's not impressed by someone's education or income or outward beauty, though he gave that to them, or their wardrobe or skin color. Those things mean nothing to God. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, it says, The Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He is a great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes bribes. Second Chronicles 19, we're told, There is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons. That's partiality or favoritism. In Acts chapter 10, you may remember the story when Peter was reluctant to go into the house of a Gentile named Cornelius. Peter was Jewish. Jews don't hang out with Gentiles. And so he goes into the house a little reluctantly, and he says this, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. It's like, dude, God loves even you. That's what he's saying in in sort of a nice way. In truth, I perceive God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Peter finally figured that out. This is an attribute that the people who saw Jesus recognized in him. He is impartial. On one occasion, a group called the Herodians approached Jesus, and they said to him, We know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone. That means you're not swayed by them. For you do not regard the person of men. So the Bible tells us that God the Father is impartial. The people that saw Jesus recognized he also was impartial. If you ever visit Washington, D.C., one of the um, main buildings in that city is the Supreme Court building. And one of the most recognizable statues on one side of the Supreme Court building is Lady Justice. And she's holding the scales. She's going to weigh things fairly. And she's blindfolded. And the blindfold around Lady Justice is to speak of impartiality in judgments. That's how courts should function. They don't always actually function that way, but the idea is that we will not regard your person. We are going to treat this case in an impartial manner. Parents should be impartial and shouldn't have favorite children. Sometimes they do. Um, Even in the Bible, they do. Remember Isaac and Rebekah in the Old Testament? They had two boys, Esau and Jacob. Uh, If you study that little passage of Scripture, you discover that Isaac seemed to favor his oldest son, Esau, but clearly Rebekah, his wife, favored the youngest son, Jacob, and that caused problems in the family. Then Jacob himself had 12 sons, and everybody knew who his favorite son was. It was Joseph. He's the kid that got the coat of many colors. And that brought a jealousy into the family that caused Joseph by his brothers to be sold human traffic down to Egypt. That's why I've always said there is a blessing in having only one child, and that is I can say unashamedly he is my favorite son. So favoritism in your house is bad. Favoritism in God's house is even worse. And that takes us to James chapter 2. We're going to look at uh, 13 verses, at least as an overview. Now, we discover, as we go through this passage, we, we discover a few truths about favoritism. And the first truth, the most obvious truth, is that people are prejudiced naturally. And when I say people, I mean all people. Let's just go through our text and notice a few things. My brethren, he's writing to believers, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, 
with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and you say to him, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. In other words, here, sit on the floor, and I see reserved for you over here. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you don't commit adultery, but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let me begin by just saying that this must have been a common problem in the congregations to which James is addressing because otherwise he would not have addressed it. He wouldn't have spent so much time dealing with it, but it was a problem. That's why he is writing about it. All of that to say this, people are partial. We put others into stratified categories, higher or lower than other people. And uh, when we do that, it is usually based on superficial things like their looks or their clothes or what they drive or the house they live in or are they uh, male or female or what age they are or what skin color they have. All external criteria. We all do this. I know you like to say, I don't. Uh, we all do this. Nobody likes to admit they're prejudiced. Nobody likes to admit they have a bias or they're partial. But I think you'll all agree we are fallen humanity. And because of the fall, we are tainted with sin. And part of the sin nature is partiality. Or to sum it up in a biblical way, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, God tells the prophet, Man looks at the outward appearance, but, finish the verse, God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Now, that statement tells us as much about human nature as about God's nature. Usually, we focus only on the second part of that verse, God looks at the heart, and we neglect the first truth in that verse, which is also true, man looks at the outward appearance. That's a general statement given by God about human nature. We are appearance-oriented. According to the American Bar Association, they put out a little journal called A Business Law Today, and they state, and I quote, we all have biases that affect all aspects of our lives and the lives of others with whom we interact, close quote. Scientists tell us that we as human beings have deeply ingrained tendencies to form groups. And we perceive people who look like us in a more positive way. When we see somebody who resembles more closely ourselves, we gravitate toward those people. Caitlin Millett, a PhD in neuroscience, stated, the human brain is wired for prejudice. She says this, and I quote, social motivations, such as the desire to be a member of a group or compete with others, are among the most basic human drives. In fact, 
our brains are able to assess in-group, us, and out-group, them, membership, within a fraction of a second. What that means in layman's terms, so you and I can grasp it, is simply this. As soon as you meet somebody, you size them up immediately. And so what they are all saying is there's a basis for our bias. So I need to quickly say this. That's not an excuse to be sinful. Just because it's part of our fallen nature, just because it's deeply ingrained to be partial to one group or to another group, it is not an excuse for sinful behavior. We should never give in to any natural proclivity. People always like to say, well, this is the way I was born to have this tendency. So you were born that way. Don't act on the impulse. Second, you should also know that prejudice is not the same thing as discernment. Discernment is a positive characteristic. It is necessary uh, in the Christian community um, to make a healthy set of distinctions between uh, of different people, different ideologies, different values. Discernment and prejudice are two different value systems altogether. And then uh, the third thing I want to say is that the Bible's stance on prejudice and equality, uh, impartiality, is completely different from a modern movement in our culture known as the DEI movement. DEI, some of you know, uh, is, um, you should know, because 61% of adults um, have to go through some kind of DEI training in the corporate structure in the world in which you live. It happens to be a $9.4 billion industry. Yes, people are making money off of this a type of indoctrination. DEI simply means diversity, equity, and inclusion. Let me just explain to you in a brief moment what that is. It is a forced inclusion imposed upon you based on race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. So in the workplace or in the educational space, People are selected not based on their skill, not based on their competence, but based on the most superficial of all factors, like skin color or ethnicity or sexual orientation. What that produces is something known as tokenism, where you get a token number of people that fit that category rather than the best possible people who can do the job. It sounds like, it's supposed to be at least, um, some noble effort to overturn racism and sexual discrimination. What it ends up doing is it produces racists and prejudiced people. Um, here's a quote from Ibram Kendi. Uh, Ibram Kendi is an uh, educator. He's an activist. He believes that all aspects of society uh, are racist, and if you deny that, it just proves that you are even more so a racist. He went so far as to say this, and I'm quoting him, the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. Do you hear what he's saying? What he's saying is two wrongs make a right. Because you've been discriminated against even if you deny that that's true, we need to discriminate against you. What does that mean in practical terms? It means that you and I are about to be in a very dangerous society. Why is that? Because it means that, uh, for example, medical schools who need to hire an oncology researcher won't look for somebody who's the best in their field but somebody who is gender fluid or a certain race or ethnicity, because you've got to fill that quota. Uh, it means that uh, airline pilots may or may not be the best pilots. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather have your pilot uh, somebody who fits the DEI paradigm, or would you rather just have the best possible pilot who can do the job? That's the difficulty. 
Now, why is all this happening in our culture? And it is more of a recent trend. It is based on the belief that certain groups are guilty and certain other groups are not guilty. Some are guilty, some are innocent. The guilty ones, that's the oppressor class. The innocent ones, that's the victim class. You are judged, you are seen, you are valued, you are treated not individually, but corporately as a group. Because you happen to have a certain background, a certain ethnicity, a certain skin color, you are either oppressor or victim. If you happen to be the victim class because of skin color or sexual preference, schools, jobs, corporate structure placements are open to you that wouldn't be open to others. That's the society in which we live. Now let's get back to the Bible, because after all, this is a Bible study. What does the Bible have to say about all this inclusion? Well, inclusion is a biblical concept. It's called the church. It's called the church. There is a fundamental redemptive quality about the church because the church was designed by God to get rid of the class structure, get rid of the differences that are between us, and have our identity in Christ alone. This is why Paul writes in Galatians 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See what he did? All the distinctions, all the little classifications are done away with because now you and I are part of this thing called the church, the body of Christ. So cultural differences, race, gender, all included in the church. Our identity is not from those subgroups, but from the group, the body of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, there was animosity between two groups, two ethnic groups, by the way. One was Jew, one was Gentile. And Paul writes this, his purpose, God's purpose, was to make peace by creating in himself one new person from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death and our hostility toward each other was put to death. So it's not your brown, white, black, male, female, this, that. You're a child of God. You're a son or daughter of the living God. In the church, that's where this diversity and inclusion reaches its pinnacle. And without the church, diversity becomes an idol we worship rather than a byproduct of the one we worship. So diversity, that kind of diversity that I just described um, from the world will turn people into very self-centered, divisive groups of people. So as James begins, he says, my brethren, my Christian brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Then notice he gives this example in the next couple of verses, uh, an example of sinful exclusion, bias, prejudice. He said, if somebody comes into your assembly, see that word assembly? The word in Greek is synagoge. What does that sound like? Synagogue. He's writing to Jewish believers who are still meeting in the synagogue. So he says, suppose you go to, to a synagogue one Sabbath, and you're there to worship God, and uh, two different people walk in. One guy with the bling. He's chic. One guy who's shabby. See, they didn't have shabby chic back then. It was you were either chic or you were shabby. In fact, you need to know this. There really was no middle class. It was absent in the ancient world. Uh, most people were in the lower class. Every now and then you'd have an upper class person. So here somebody comes in dressed to the nines, chic, then somebody comes in shabby. Now, things have changed quite a bit. So today, you have lousy-looking clothes that are phenomenally priced. 
And so now you can tell if a person has money because they're wearing really lousy looking clothes. Go, oh, that person must have money. Look at the holes in his jeans. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> so people are prejudiced naturally. Second truth is that favoritism is foolish logically. Now, I want you to notice what James does. Favoritism is wrong because of the character and nature of God, because of the person and nature of Jesus Christ, and because of what the Scriptures say. It's contrary to the Scripture, but it's also contrary to basic logic. And James asks four questions to appeal to the rationale of his audience. Four logical questions. First one is in verse 4. It's at a practical level. He says, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? In other words, you're dividing people superficially, just on the outward appearance. True story. In the fall of 1775, what looked like an average American farmer tried to check himself into a fashionable hotel in Baltimore. The manager of the hotel, because of the high class of the hotel, was worried about the reputation of his institution if he were to rent a room to this poor farmer, so he turned him away, and that farmer went somewhere else. Until the manager discovered that farmer was none other than Thomas Jefferson, who at the time was the vice president of the United States under John Adams. So he sent a letter to Jefferson begging him to come back at his own expense. He would sponsor him. He would take care of him. He would be welcome as his guest. Jefferson's response was simple. He said this, I value your good intentions highly, but if you have no place for an American farmer, you have no right giving hospitality to the vice president of the United States. So that's the practical level that James is approaching his audience with. You're dividing people superficially. He says, you become people with evil thoughts, that is, evil motives. You're trying to get something from that person who has money. Second question is in verse 5, and, and this is the spiritual level. After looking at it on a practical level, he looks at it on a spiritual level, and he says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world? to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him, but you have dishonored the poor man. What he's saying in the second question is, you're dishonoring the very one that God wants to honor. Why is that? Well, you'll notice in the ministry of Jesus that, well, I'll ask you, when it came to the people who followed Jesus, were most of them rich or most of them poor? They were poor. They were the common people, right? It tells us in the Gospel of Mark. The common people heard him gladly. The farmers heard him gladly. In Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist sends a message to Jesus because he's a little bit uncertain if Jesus is the Messiah. So he sends some messengers say, ask this Jesus, are you the coming one or should we look for another? Jesus says, go tell John this. Go tell John, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lepers are cleansed, the lame walk, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Then Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, my life verse, by the way, says, you see, you see your calling, brethren, not many mighty, not many noble has God called. Don't, don't make a mistake with that. Paul didn't say not any, he just said not many. Every now and then you get a noble, mighty, brilliant, rich believer. But for the most part, not many mighty, not many noble are called. For God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, those things that are weak and based and despised. So most of the citizens of the kingdom of God through the centuries have been the farmers the common people, the poor, and they are dishonoring. James is saying, you are dishonoring the one that God honors. Heard a great story, and I've always loved this story, 
Um, don't know if it's true or not, but it's a good story. Uh, it was a woman who was trying to get into a fashionable church, and um, they were really reticent to let her in, and so she tried to go back several times, and they hemmed and hawed, and they said, well, you've got to go through this hoop and that hoop. So finally, she came again one Sunday. She was very poor, and it was a very wealthy congregation, and one of the elders said to her, well, go home and pray about it for a month and see what God has to say. So she left, and she never returned. One day, that elder was out in the community and saw her working at a job pushing a broom and said, hey, I recognize you. You're that lady trying to join our church. Did you ever pray about it? Uh Uh-huh. And did God ever answer you back? She goes, yes, he did, as a matter of fact. As I prayed about it and poured out my heart, because I really wanted to come to your church, I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart and told me this, don't worry. I've been trying to get into that church myself for over 30 years with no more success than you've had. That takes us to the third question. That's a historical level that he approaches them at. Verse 6, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts. Evidently, those in the rich segment of society were oppressing these poor believers, dragging them into court. It's sort of still true these days. If you have money, you can afford to hire your own attorney. If you're poor, they give you a public defender in court. So what what James is essentially saying on this historical level is why would you pander to the very group that has been against you historically? Why would you be building up the very ones that are trying to tear you down? Why would you pander to that? Or as John Calvin brilliantly captured it, why honor your executioners? The fourth question is in verse 7. And it's on a relational level. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? What is the name we bear? The name of Christ. We are Christians. We call ourselves according to his name. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? They blaspheme the very name that you love, Christ Um, Sometimes I notice that Christians pander to God-haters in a society. Rock stars, actors, politicians. They just love them, love them, love them. But then listen to what they say about you and about the Christ that you serve. So just from a purely logical level, he's noticing they're pandering to a group of people And he's saying that makes no sense. Here's another true story. It's heartbreaking. Mahatma Gandhi, he writes this in his own book, his autobiography. Mahatma Gandhi, the Indian leader, in his student days went to a Christian church because he had been reading the Gospels. And in reading the four Gospels, especially the, the teachings of Jesus Christ, he noticed that this Jesus is different from anything I've ever heard before. And it seems to me that the only answer to the caste system in our culture, in India, high and low caste, you know about that. So the only answer is the gospel. This is the answer that would solve the problem of the caste differences in our culture. And he believed that so strongly in his student days that he decided, I'm going to go to a church and convert and become a Christian. So one Sunday, he went to uh, church. He is studying to become a lawyer at the time. As he entered the building, the usher refused to give him a seat, turned him away, and suggested that he go worship with his own kind. He was very dark-skinned. Go worship with your own kind. Mahatma Gandhi left the church, never to return. And in his autobiography, he writes these words, If Christians also have caste differences then I might as well remain a Hindu. Never went back. Heartbreaking story. 
So people are prejudiced naturally. That's the first truth, else James would not have written this. Favoritism is foolish logically. He asks them four logical questions to appeal to their rationale. Third, Christians are corrected biblically. It's one thing to approach somebody logically, but if you're a Christian, where the change happens is when you get chapter and verse. And so he gives them that. Look at verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, now he's pulling out the big guns, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So he's using Scripture to correct the thinking of the brethren in these places. And uh, he's quoting a very famous verse, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Who said that? I'm, it was a trick question, actually. Yes, he did say that, but he's not the one who originally said that. That actually comes from the law. That comes from way back in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 8. It says, you shall not bear a grudge against any of the people around you, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, of course, Jesus did affirm that, and of all the teachings in the Bible, this one truth is perhaps the most revolutionary truth, to love your neighbor as yourself. Notice he calls it the royal law. Why the royal law? Because though it was spoken about in the Old Testament, the king of kings himself affirmed it. And let me just tell you one of the ways he affirmed it. One day Jesus quoted Leviticus 19, and he said uh, to the people who were listening to him, he said, uh, you can sum up the whole law by, by two things. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And some hot shot in the crowd listening to him said, well, who's my neighbor? Right? Who's my neighbor? And he wanted to put a fine point, a nuance to it. Because that could mean a lot of things, my neighbor. So Jesus said, let me tell you who your neighbor is. A man went from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves. The thieves beat him up, laid him on the side of the road. A Levite came by, passed by on the other side. A priest came by, passed by on the other side. Two religious Jewish people. Finally, a Samaritan came by, bandaged his wounds, cared for him, paid the money to the innkeeper. In other words, this is your neighbor. Anyone that you know has a need. Love your neighbor as yourself. Care for others like you care for yourself. He quotes that scripture, calls it the royal law. Then, as we keep going down in our text, I just want to point it out before we read it in a moment. He quotes two other verses. In verse 11, do not commit adultery. And the next one, do not murder. Two more verses of Scripture from Exodus chapter 20. Why? Because the Scripture is the basis for all our activity. Right? It's the reason we do things. It's because the Bible says. It's not, we don't do things, well, you know, we've always done it that way. No, we do it because this is what the Bible says about that. So it's always the Bible that should be the source of our authority for our activity and our change. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So James is correcting them biblically because Christians are corrected biblically. Fourth and final truth I want to point out to you is that life should be lived consistently. And that's what James is addressing in the remainder of the verses, verse 10. For whoever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, can you imagine somebody saying that? I didn't break the law, I only murdered somebody. <laughs> At least I didn't sleep with another man's wife. Yeah, but you're a murderer. He's using extreme examples here. 
If you do that, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's pretty apparent that James knew that some people in his audience who would read this letter would dismiss the idea proffered by James that their prejudice was a big deal. You know, they would see it as, ah, it's trivial. It's not a big deal. It's a white sin. It's a white, kind of a white lie. I'm a little bit prejudiced, but who isn't? Uh, People kind of do that today. They like to say, I'm not as bad as that guy. You know, I'm not perfect, but I'm not a murderer. But Jesus did say, you may not be a murderer physically, but if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. You may not be an adulterer, but if you lust after somebody, you are a murderer. An adulterer. So James' point with these extreme examples of adultery and murder is simply to showcase inconsistent obedience. Inconsistent obedience. Life should be lived consistently. A lawbreaker is a lawbreaker. If somebody breaks the law, he is now by definition a lawbreaker. He's broken the law. The law is like a chain with ten links. Let me ask you this. If you break one link, did you break the chain? You broke the chain. The same God who said don't be an adulterer is the same God who said don't kill, don't steal, don't covet. If you break one law, you're a lawbreaker. So his point is this. Consistent obedience is required if spiritual maturity is to be attained. If you're going to write one thing down, write that down. Consistent obedience is required if spiritual maturity is to be attained. So then we should accept all brothers and sisters with courtesy, compassion, and consistency, just as love triumphs over prejudice, mercy triumphs over judgment. By the way, you should know this. There was found an ancient church manual It goes way back, hundreds, maybe even thousands of years, ancient church manual from the churches in Ethiopia, evidently based upon what we just read in James. It gives instructions in that manual, if somebody rich comes into your congregation, that the presbyter, the elder, is to do nothing at all. Just let that person be welcomed by the congregation. But if somebody poor comes in, the presbyter was to make sure that he was welcome and had a place to sit, even if the presbyter, the elder, had to give up his own seat. Oh, there's a poor person. Let me give him my seat. That's exactly what Jesus did. When he left the place of incomparable glory and came down to this earth, to save us. Let me remind you of the verse, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. What James is advocating is nothing less than what Jesus himself practiced. He gave up his life. He gave up his status and his position to serve, to make us who are spiritually poor eternally wealthy. Now, as we began the service, one of the songs we sang, do you remember it, is I Surrender All? I love that song. We all sang it, at least most of us did. I Surrender All, but truth be told, Some of you have not surrendered at all. You've not surrendered your life to Christ. You watch people around you who have surrendered, and that's good. We're glad you're here. We don't care why you're here. We're glad that you are here. We don't care who you are, what you have. We don't want anything from you. But we do want you eternally rich, eternally wealthy. We want you to have the salvation that we enjoy. 
And you should know that Jesus Christ left his throne of glory to make that possible. I call it the great exchange. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he made it possible. But like DEI that is forced upon us, or unlike that, he will not force you to be saved. He will not force you to go to heaven. There's people who say, I want nothing to do with God. Okay, you don't have to have anything to do with God. Ever. And if you don't want anything to do with God here, he, won't, he would never make you live with him forever in heaven. God forbid that you should have eternal heaven because you want nothing to do with God. But if you want your life changed, if you want salvation to come to your life, it, it's possible, but you need to surrender to him. You need to give your life to him. You need to receive Christ as your savior. He paid the debt that you owe so that you might have heaven. He'll not force it, but he wants to make you eternally rich, wealthy. I want you to bow your head with me, and I want you just to think as we pray about your own life, nobody nobody else, nobody who's not here, or your neighbor, or husband, or wife. Don't think about them. Just think about you. Father, thank you that this is a word for us. This is a message of the word for us. And Lord, we um, examine ourselves in the pure light of your word, and we realize that we come up short. This book of James is very practical, and truth be told, it hurts sometimes when we read these verses. And we're just grateful that James didn't pull any punches, but just said, don't show favoritism. It doesn't honor God. It dishonors the people God wants to honor and love and show mercy to. And so, Father, we not only pray that love would triumph over prejudice and that we would love people not because we're mandated to or we have to or we're instructed by the corporation to, but we do it because we want to, because we love you. It's relational. We pray, Lord, for those who might be with us, who have been brought here, invited here. They're here, but for whatever reason, they have not said yes to the Savior personally. We pray that will change here and now. With your head bowed as you're just thinking about your life, and you think of all the things you've done in your life and to make yourself happy for your life, you realize that All those things, whether it's something you bought or a person you married or a job you worked hard to get, all of those things, as wonderful as they may be for a while, they have not produced the level of satisfaction that you thought they would. And that's the way life is. Life always comes up short when you don't have a relationship with the living God who made you. Life isn't complete. You're missing the most important piece. And that's Jesus Christ, the God who made you, the God who created you, created you with a hole inside your heart that can only be filled with him. You'll always be thirsty until you drink of living water. If you want that to change, and only you can want that to change for it to count, if you want that to change and you're willing to say yes to the Savior, you're tired of running away from him. If you want to say yes to him, maybe you need to come back to the faith because you've wandered away from it. You need a rededication of your life. You're not living for Christ now, or you've never personally asked Jesus to come in. If, you're, if you want to do that, then I want you to raise your hand in the air just so I can see it. And I'll notice it, and I'll say, God bless you, and then you can put it down. But raise it up high. If you're here today and you're going to say, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to change the direction of my life. Just raise your hand up. God bless you and you and you and you. Right up here in the front and on my right toward the back. In the back in the middle. God bless you. In the balcony. I love this. We're so glad you're here. Anyone else? Anyone else? Just raise that hand up. Father, thank you for these. God bless you. Oh, Lord. Convince those with raised hands, 
how much you love them, you're willing to receive them, wanting to forgive them, bring them into your family, give them hope, meaning, purpose, joy, and when it's all over, heaven with you. Thank you for the great sacrifice of our Savior, that he didn't just preach love, he loved. He didn't preach sacrifice, he sacrificed. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand to our feet. I'm gonna ask you to do one final thing if you raise your hand. Don't let this scare you. I'm gonna ask you as we sing this last song for you to get up from where you're standing, find the nearest aisle, walk up here to the front. When you've all come together, I'm gonna to lead you in a prayer to receive Christ. We don't do this to embarrass anyone. We do this to encourage you because there's something about making it public and being willing to take a stand for Christ in a crowd that supports it, that'll help you stand for Christ out there in a world that does not support it. So get up and come. God bless you, buddy. So glad you came. Yes, glad you're here. I'm about to lead this group that has come forward in a prayer. Uh, if you're in the balcony, you can still make your way down the stairs. We'll wait for you. In fact, if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ and you're sort of hemming and hawing and wondering, should I do this? You should be running down here. You should be, if there's one thing you need to be certain about, it's where you're gonna spend forever and ever. Just saying. So anybody else want to take God up on his offer to freely give you everlasting life? It's free. You've got everything to gain. You've got nothing to lose. You've tried so many other things in life. Give Jesus a chance. That was a bumper sticker back in the old days. Give Jesus a chance. Would you give him a chance? Give him a chance. Let him into your life. Let him see what he can do with you. Anyone else? Just come up now before we pray. You know you should be here. Get up here. <laughs> Those of you who are here, my privilege to lead you in a prayer. As I pray this prayer, I want you to pray it out loud after me. Mean this from your heart. You're just giving Jesus the rest of your life. You're just turning over the keys to the rest of your life to the God who made you, who has a perfect plan for you. So let's pray. Say, Lord, I give you my life. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus, that he died on a cross, that he shed his blood for me, that he rose again. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow him as my Lord. Help me. It's in his name I pray. Amen. If you've come forward, follow me over here. Let's go over this. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We would love to know how this teaching has impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church.